Welcome to another episode of A Contagious Smile. We're going to do an unstoppable episode because some of this might be a trigger warning for some people. So we want to put that out there ahead of time. I have Dana with us today. She is an amazing warrior. She's a mom. She's a wife. She's an author. She's just an amazing person that we want to shine her story and give you guys some more information on how you are strong enough more than you think to get out of where you are and get your life back. Dana, thank you so much for coming on and being with us today. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm glad to be on. Thank you for having me. Of course. So you came from a narcissistic background. And uh, yes, unfortunately, I've dealt with it my whole life. Um, you know, I was born to a teenage mother who did not want me. Um, and she actually had her tubes tied immediately after my birth. So I'm not sure she wanted any children. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was tough being born into that situation just because starting with my own mother, there was always this emotional detachment from me. Um, I, I was blessed with my great grandma. However, she loved me like a mother should. So I had a concept of what love was and, and, you know, she was literally everything a mother should be, but I only lived with her for a short time because my mother did find somebody, um, and got married pretty quickly after, um, I think I was probably a year old when they met and started dating, but I never liked him, um, from the get go. I didn't know what a narcissist was. Um, I was just a kid. I was just going where I was supposed to go and doing what I was supposed to do. But I just knew there was something about him I couldn't put my finger on. He seemed funny and charming and nice, like he did and said all the right things. But it's like I saw through it. I could see that it was just a facade because behind closed doors, I mean, he was just a monster. Right. The mask um, comes off. The mask comes off, but at the same time, my mother was wearing the mask too. Um, she was turning her head to it. She was ignoring it. And, and here's another term that's used a lot, the gaslighting. From the time I can remember, my own mother was gaslighting me um, to think that I was delusional. He, he didn't mean anything by that. Oh, you're just sensitive. It was about me. It wasn't that something was wrong with him. You know, and it eventually, as I grew older, um, you know, and I should say it started with the verbal abuse, you know, whenever he and I were alone because he would get me ready for school in the mornings. It started with, you know, you know, your mother doesn't love you. I shouldn't have to pay for you because you're another man's child. You weren't even supposed to exist. I don't know why you're, you know, all these things. And I heard this every day. So, I mean, needless to say, low self-esteem. I, I, I even struggled with God because I was born and raised in the Catholic church, went to Catholic school. And I'm thinking, why did God put me here? If I, I mean, if I wasn't supposed to be here and if nobody's going to love me, why am I even here? And I'm having these struggles, you know, before I'm even 10 years old <laughs> and um, it, it, you should just be able to be a kid. Yes. So I knew it wasn't right, but then the physical abuse started to play into it if I defended myself or simply started, you know, cause I was a strong willed child, you know, don't talk to me that way. It's not right. I'm going to tell my mother, you know, he would grab me, but grip me so tightly that mm -hmm. it was malicious and he would leave hand marks and bruises. And then it, it, you know, the narcissistic abuse is insidious because it's like they keep pushing the boundaries when they know they can get away with something. They push a little more, a little more, you know, so then it was, you know, once I grabbed the phone to call somebody, I was going to call my mother and tell her the things he was saying and doing. And he took the phone and beat me over the head with it. Um, it was being grabbed at the back of the head and, and my head banged against the wall. And, and it was hard then because then I go to school and I have to pretend everything's OK. I have to wipe my tears, you know, use my bangs to cover up my forehead with the bruises. Um, but every once in a while teachers would see marks on me or see that something was wrong. I'd be sent to the nurse. They pull out the, you know, they have a sheet of paper for those who've never been in this situation at the school. The school nurse has a paper with a very generic um, outline of a human body. Um, and then they start having you, you know, show, you know, remove your sleeves or your sweatshirt or whatever your roll up your pants. They want to see the marks on your body and they document it and date it. And, 
you know, it's humiliating. And then you go back to to the classroom and the kids are all asking, what happened? What did you do? Why did they call you out? And you don't want anyone to know you're ashamed. And why we as victims carry the shame, I'm still trying to understand, but we are, we are, uh, you know, we're burdened with it. Yes. And they're not, they're not burdened. No, and they're not at all, at all. And that was the tough part of it is because, you know, I was also struggling because at school I was, you know, called illegitimate. I was called a bastard child. Um, most of the little kids, you know, would tell me they're not allowed to play with me because I'm Ill- illegitimate because I'm a bastard. The teachers would openly talk about, you know, my, my situation. And I just felt like I was getting it in all ways. So, I mean, you know, mentally, I feel like my mental health, like never had a chance, right. <laughs> you know, but I was still very strong and, and, and I knew it wasn't right. So you, you, you just plug through every day. I, I knew what I had to do to avoid getting beaten at home. And I knew to just fly under the radar all around. Um, you know, so I tried to just do the best I could and, and just live, but it's very different when you're growing up that way, because that shame carries into every part of your life. I had a couple friends and sometimes I'd have them over. Sometimes I'd have sleepovers, but I tried not to have them over if somebody was home because I would be embarrassed about, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the way I was treated and I didn't, didn't want them going back and telling their parents. And unfortunately, even the couple friends I did have, you know, did say something that, you know, alerted the parents to, what was going on, or at least gave them the idea that something might be happening. So then the next time I was at their house, you know, I would get, are you safe? Is he beating your mother too? And I'm like, honestly, I don't know. I have no idea. I've never seen it, but my mother was also very quiet and very submissive. And whenever I went to her, (laughs) She would either tell me it didn't happen. He said, you're lying. I think you're just trying to get attention. Or I'd get my favorite response, which I heard too often. And I think which set me up for an, the abuse of marriage that I had, which was, well, he's only doing that to the extent that he loves you, which means to me that if somebody loves me, they're going to hurt me. Right. Right. You know, and what I hate is that we are like, we have to stop the cycle. We have to stop this cycle because the, our kids do not need to spend their adulthood recovering from their childhood. They they, Exactly. And, you know, I was in the same thing and I, I've like always wondered why is it the ones of us that shouldn't be on the couch or on the couch and the ones who need to be on the couch, never go to the couch because they don't think anything's wrong. Amen. That that is always my issue. I actually, it, it, It aggravates me Mm -hmm. through the many times in my life that people have said you should get help. It's so offensive to me because I'm like, you know what? I am struggling with some things, but the people who need help. Absolutely. You're absolutely spot on. They, nobody points to them and says they need help. Everybody enables it, turns the other way. I have been ostracized and shunned from every side of my family and because I spoke up about it yet they get to live their lives normally they get to continue on as if nothing happened there is no justice for us no there is and that is why I do speak out because I'm not afraid anymore and if somebody wants to hurt me I will not be shy about you know pursuing some you know consequences for them because I should not have had to bear the burden all of the I'm going to be 48 in two months, 48 years of my life. I have, I would say last year was about this time last year when I completed some CPTSD therapy, I finally came to some peace and came to terms with it where I could get through a holiday season, you know, without crying and sobbing every day and wondering why I'm still here. But 40 some years of my life, because other people were insecure and needed to fulfill their ego and feel like big, bad men. Um, And I'm not saying women don't do this because obviously my mother was participant, but you know, in my life, it's been men mainly. And it it just disgusts me. 
It, it just, there needs to be more consequences for them. And I'm not sure that they can be rehabilitated mentally, I don't but think so. I, yeah, I don't believe so honestly, but who am I to judge? I just don't think that I should, you know, people just want to point to the victims and say, you need help. There's something wrong with you. You're, I don't like this verbiage about, um, when I hear people say I'm broken, I'm damaged because I'm not broken. I'm not damaged. Right. I might've been knocked down a, a few too many times, literally and figuratively, but I'm standing right back up. Sure. I am a whole person and I deserve better. Yes. And that's, you know, what I want people to understand that are in the same situations that you and I have been in is that you, you don't have to be a victim. You can choose to get back up on your feet. You know, it, it there's more to life Absolutely. than what one person or a few people think of you. Yes. Dana, did you go through when, when you went through this as a child, and I'm so sorry that you went through all this and then you go through in your teenage years and you start dating, did you kind of realize that you were going towards that kind of person? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There were nice boys. There were a couple nice boys that asked me on dates, but I didn't know what to do with them. Honestly, right. it made me very, very uncomfortable. It was almost, I territory. Hate, I hate to say it was boring. It was boring. It's foreign territory. I needed to go out with the guy who, um, you know, would tell me that I don't need to order apple pie at dinner because it would ruin my figure. I needed to be with the guy who treated me badly in front of his friends because he had to look cool, um, but was very sweet to me when it was just the two of us. I absolutely had to be with that guy. That's mm -hmm. why I'm not surprised looking back that I ended up with my ex-husband. I spent 25 years with the man. And I mean, right from the day I met him, the second I met him, I thought, what a jerk. This guy is aloof. He's distant. He thinks he's better than everybody. He reminded me of my stepfather. Mm -hmm. But what did I do? I, I just walked right into that open door. Yes. Now, do you have any siblings or is it just you? Well, it's not just me. My mother and her husband did end up, she had to go through several years of a re, for a reversal tubal ligation. Forgive me, that's a tongue twister. <laughs> but um, she did end up having a successful pregnancy. So they did have their own child. I was about 14. He was actually born on my very first day of high school. So it was a little traumatic. Yeah. Uh, it was a traumatic day for me. <laughs> but um you know, even before he was born, when my mother was pregnant with my brother, uh, my stepfather would, you know, tell me that I'm not a part of this family. The three of them are going to be a family. I'm not part of it. And it was really hard watching my little brother, like in preschool, draw pictures of the family. And it was just him and his mom and dad. I wasn't in it. And it made me wonder, like, even at that young age, what was he seeing and hearing you know, that was making him believe that I wasn't part of this family. And, it, you know, again, it's very hurtful and damaging. And to this day, one of the biggest um, things that I had to deal with in my therapy for CPTSD was the feeling of exclusion. Mm -hmm. You know, as humans, we want connection. We want to belong. I couldn't even get a connection with my mother. And basically from the day I was born outside of my relationship with my great grandma, who's no longer with us, I was told I didn't belong anywhere. I was told I didn't even belong on this earth. Right. So you had that no is, safe place, not at school, not at home, no. nowhere. So you had no safe ground. No, no. I did have a boyfriend that I connected with in high school. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, in high school, right, things don't last as long as you'd want them to. But, you know, he was somebody that I definitely at least got me through a couple of years during that tougher time. Um, because we did truly, you know, and people could say, Oh, you were young and whatever, but we did truly have a connection. And I knew that he loved me as much as you know, you could love somebody at, at 16 years old or whatever. But, um, I was safe with, and his mother was a very good person. She was always there. I could confide in her about things, but unfortunately, you know, people, I don't, I understand people are afraid to step in or overstep their bounds, but it, it's still hard that 
even now as an adult, and now that I've been speaking out and everything, there are people that knew me back then that have reached out to me and said, yeah, I thought I could see some signs of it, or I knew what was going on and I didn't do anything. You know, I even had somebody reach out to me recently that I hadn't spoken to in over 30 years. And she knew my parents, my mother and stepfather. And she said, I, I'm so glad you're alive because I always thought that I would see you on the news having been found dead in a ditch. And I mean, I don't hold her responsible, but again, it's like, if you really thought Why you that out? he was capable of this or, and that my mother was, that just really hurts to know that I was struggling and, and people were seeing it, but they didn't come to my rescue, right. nor did they when I was an adult, you know, because many people saw it, um, you know, in my previous marriage as well, but people did not intervene. Or they chose to just look the other way and pretend it wasn't going on. So is, was your brother the golden child? And you're definitely oh, absolutely. It Yes. I mean, in every aspect, in every way, it, I am the epitome of the sta- scapegoat. Yes. My brother is absolutely the golden child. Yes. But at the same time, I want to say I'm not resentful to him. I am glad that... If you had him standing here right next to me right now, he would tell you that he has the two best parents in the universe, that they are exemplary and wonderful because they are to him. That just makes it that much worse for me because that just shows me it was a choice. And I knew it was a choice, but his childhood affirms that. (laughs) And that's a real tough pill to swallow, you know, to know that, you know, I remember in the nineties, when that book came out, a child called it, It? Mm -hmm. a lot of that resonated with me so deeply, because for those of you have, who have not read the book, it it is a good read. If you can handle, um, read it, it, talk about triggering though. It's a lot, but you know, this is the child that was called it was one of, by the end of, I think they ended up having five children altogether. I think he was the third one, but he had multiple siblings and he was the only one that was abused, but so severely it was just, there were chapters that I couldn't even, I had to restart five, six times before I could get through and stomach them. But you know, it it was the same kind of situation. So that resonated with me because I didn't understand how parents could treat one child. So I I mean, night and day different, differently from each other, but I never wanted my brother to have to endure. I wouldn't want anyone to endure any part of what I had to. And so many kids had it much worse than me. So I don't want to complain either, but I don't want to invalidate my experience. Right. But still, I don't want anyone to ever go through anything like that. So I'm glad he got two good parents that he loves and he's very close with them and they've been very supportive and encouraging. And he just got married last year and they love his wife. And that hurts even more because, you know, they, they, they're just, it, it's just hard. It's hard to see that and to know that they are just choosing not to let me in. Right. And I get it, Dana, completely. I, I have no relationship. I have no contact with both of my parents. I still wish them well. Um, they yeah. wrote not only me off, but they wrote off my daughter who's special needs. Um, oh my gosh. You know, when we were in the hospital and we were in the ICU, nothing. Um, they knew that I got amputated. My arm got amputated, nothing. And um, when I was growing up, I was the one that there's not any of us kids get along with both parents. And I was the only one who, remotely got along with my biological dad and my brother who I wish nothing but the best for hates me because he only hears what is being put into his head from his mom and honestly yeah. David, their relationship was so different than the common uh, golden child because like they went on vacations together just the two of them she would refer to him as her husband um yeah they would go on a cruise together every year and they even shared a room together and I, I just, he, he never understood how to do anything by himself. And I kept saying, y'all are not helping him at all because 
literally like she made every bank deposit for him. He is a very smart guy, very, very brilliant mm. guy. And he had, I mean, he has his master's, but he is a waiter at the same place that he's been at at a deli for like 18 years. And he has a master's. He's wow. so smart, but like, you know, she does his laundry. She does his bank deposits for him. I mean, you know, they share custody of the dog, like the little tiny dog. He comes oh, over and gets the dog, but he has no relationship with the bio dad. And it's, I knew when I was growing up and he was little that he was, he was gay. And I told him numerous times, as long as you're with someone who doesn't treat you disrespectfully and doesn't put their hands right. on you in an unwarranted manner, I don't care. But his parents because they're definitely his, well, absolutely wouldn't accept it. Like my dad would not accept it at all. Mm -hmm. And then my dad used me and my daughter to cover up all of his women that he had on the side. And he would say, oh, I'm going out with the girls. And he would go meet a woman. And there were times that he'd call and say, hey, let's just grab a bite to eat. And he'd show up with another woman. And mm -hmm. I was like, absolutely not. And I think one of them that really just broke it altogether was, I always took my daughter on like mom daughter trips because there was always so much medical between us. And it was just her and I was a single mom for so long. And I said, come on, we're going to go out of town for the weekend and go to the aquarium and go do this and go just do whatever. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to go with my girls. And I was like, wait, what? And he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll go with y'all. Okay. We're getting our own room. We're not sharing a room with you. Mm -hmm. I think that's not appropriate. And I'm driving. I've always been this person that I, I have to drive. Like I'm going to yeah. drive. So we drove, we got there Friday, long story short, Friday nights, pouring down rain, everything. We ate dinner, got back to the room. No big deal. He went to his room, whatever. Saturday morning, we got up, had breakfast, went to go do that blowing glass thing. For you. Yeah. And then I said, okay, it's going to rain soon. Let's get umbrellas. Let's go back to the room and get umbrellas. And then we'll walk to the aquarium. So he said, okay, what room are you in again? I forgot. I'll meet you there in 30 minutes. Fine. Knock on the door. My daughter, Faith, goes to open the door and there is my dad and a woman younger than me with her toddler. And I'm like, are you, are you kidding me right now? And he was like, come on, we're going to the aquarium. Who, mm -hmm. Who's going to the aquarium? So this just went on and on. Then they decided to go out. My daughter had asked grandpa to take her to a movie, a theater for the longest time. He never would take her, but they came to mine and my daughter's room left the toddler and went to the movies which he wouldn't take her to see but he took this other one this woman and they went to the movie theater and my daughter literally was taking pictures of them the whole weekend like snapping pictures of them canoodling in the booth together and whatever wow. i was like i'm done i'm not even going to be around this this had been something i had experienced my whole childhood growing up now he's bringing my daughter in it and that does not sit with me and he's saying well you don't tell your grandma that she was up here and blah 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 and I was like oh, I did not teach gosh. my daughter to lie so what finally ended it for me was I went to her and I had a lot of stuff in their storage and I asked if I could get it and they put my stuff out on the lawn like on the front porch and stuff like I was being evicted and they live in a multi-million dollar home and I, I walked away from all of it because money doesn't buy happiness it's just not gonna buy it and I went yes. there, I contemplated it, Dana, I contemplated and contemplated. I went over there and I had no relationship with my mom. She was all about her son. I was a worthless piece of crap that was just, I was a meal ticket to my dad. They got together and here I am pregnant. You know, she's pregnant with me. And so I said, look, in no way, shape, form, or fashion am I doing this in malice. I am doing this because I don't want to hold this burden anymore. I not brought all the evidence I have, but I want you to know what your husband's doing behind your back because you deserve to know. Right. And I showed her photographs. I showed her text messages. I showed her, there's probably three, 400 different things, uh, not an exaggeration of like all these different things. And he would show me, he would send me pictures of them. Like, look, look what we're doing. Why would you do that? I don't know. And I said, I'm not trying to hurt you. There are messages in there from my dad just destroying my brother about what a POS he is because he's and horrible yeah. names, which I won't say. But like, and I said, if I wanted to do this in Dallas, I would have gone to him and let him see this. But I'm not going to and I never will because I don't want to hurt him. I know what this will do to him. And I never showed them. But instead, they wrote my daughter and I off. And said, and and she's like, there's two sides to every story. What other side is there to he brought a woman to the hotel 
didn't tell you about it and here they are kissing in a picture what other story is there to this and I got blamed that I was trying to break up the marriage I said I didn't put their mouth together you know and yeah. I said, y'all done this to me my whole life and I cannot do it anymore I can't take it anymore and it was well there had to be a reason okay well what about this woman or this woman there are all different women here and it was all so they wrote us off and they even told us we're not even allowed on their property hmm. because of this. And now we're no contact. And I hate that because whenever I hear from anyone I know that they know them, I'm like, how's they doing? And people are like, why do you care? And I said, because if I didn't care, I'd be just like them. Right. And it sucks because I wish I didn't. I wish I didn't care. But then I would be just like them. You know, and, and it's. I do know, unfortunately, everything you're saying is resonating with me too closely because, you know, yeah, that's what it feels like to be the scapegoat. You could have nothing to do with a situation, but you are blamed. You are absolutely. somehow blamed for it. You are responsible for it. And like your mother, my mother also chooses her situation. You know, when, when, three times in my life, we've gone no contact, but the last time I just, I had to be done for my own sanity. Like you said, I don't wish anyone harm, but it was not, I couldn't do it. I could not be around them without shaking and, and panicking and losing my breath. And it just wasn't worth it anymore. And, right. and I was not going to continue to submit myself to being insulted and gaslighted. And it, it just was an endless, the cycle of abuse. Yes. And like you said, I, I broke it. I'm done with it. Good for you. Unfortunately, I left my, you know, my marriage. I, uh, you know, I was with the man 25 years. I ended it literally within six months of going no contact with my mother and stepfather for the final time. So it was a really dark time for me, but mm -hmm. it was also a really positive time for my mental and physical health. And, and, and I'm fine. It, it sucks, but yes. I'm fine because there are plenty of people in my life, even though I was isolated and was not allowed to have friends and go anywhere and do anything there were still people in the shadows waiting for me to come back into the world that had no obligation to love me, but they do. Right. And even if they didn't, I had finally come to love myself in the end and choose myself because I had to. Right. I had to. I could not sit around hoping and waiting you know, for a mother who was never going to love me the way I wanted my mother to love me or a stepfather that was going to suddenly not be an abusive narcissist, you know, and, and you just have to let it go. And, you know, same with my brother. I love my brother very much, but he chooses to believe the things he hears. And, you know, I, I haven't heard from him and I think it's been about a year and I'm tired of trying and always be the one kind of forcing a relationship where one isn't organically taking place. And, um, did you find yourself apologizing for things that you had no involvement? Oh, I still, to this day, I'm trying to break that habit, but I was always the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And even with my husband now, and he'll be like, why are you sorry? Well, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I'm in your way. I'm sorry. I'm bothering you. I'm sorry. Everything because I feel like a bother and a burden. And I think I always will, even that, though I tell myself and I know intellectually I'm not, I will always feel like if I call him and he says, Hey, can I call you back? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bother you. You know, when you were over there or at work or whatever, you feel I'm sorry. Adequate. I'm in the way of the refrigerator when you're trying to open it. He's like, it's not a big deal. Relax. And I can't because I'm always going to feel responsible for everything and everybody around me. And when somebody around me or, you know, close to me is not happy, I'm going to think it's because of something I said or did or didn't do or what yeah. I should have done. And, and always worrying, yeah. worrying, worrying, because I am responsible. I am the reason why people are happy or unhappy. Right. So you always feel inadequate. Always. And, and I was blamed for things that I wasn't even around for. Like, I know. <laughs> you're, you're constantly like, oh, that, that vase is broken. It broke. I was at my grandparents for the weekend. How right. did it get broke? Uh, you did it. Okay. Right. Great. Okay. My right. Fault. And you get to that point where you don't even fight back anymore because it's just so exhausting. It's yeah. exhausting. And then they go. But I was contact. getting it from my mother, my stepfather, and my, my, well, now my ex-husband, but 
you know, the three, what are supposed to be the primary people in my life. And then that's not even, you know, even in my marriage, you know, the, this man was swinging crowbars at my head, putting holes in the wall. He was, you know, violent, you know, he, even after the divorce, we had a couple of domestic violence situations because he, he emailed me and told our neighbors he was planning to kill me. I mean, so I'm, <laughs> you know, some people have had it much, much worse, but I will say this, that, you know, for all the people who don't understand Physical abuse is awful, but gosh, I wish that I, I could have gotten through that. But the verbal stuff and, and not just the verbal, the nonverbal. Yes. Because my mother, my stepfather, and my ex-husband would all use the silent treatment on me. And nobody Sometimes understands was, that's the worst. No, it is the worst. Sometimes it was for a few days and sometimes it was for weeks. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess they call it ghosting now, but I could be in a room and be looking them in the eye. And I mean, I remember a couple of times screaming at my mother, you know, because she would not even, she literally would not acknowledge even my presence, wouldn't even look in my direction. And I'm screaming, trying to get her attention, trying to get her to say anything. And nothing. And it would tear us apart and not phase them at all. It's a military tactic that they used in Guantanamo Bay with war prisoners. It is cruel. It's very to cruel. invalidate somebody's existence. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I'm standing here now thinking about it and it makes me want to cry because and then what do I do? I am very happily remarried now to somebody I've known a very long time, but God help me if this man isn't quiet and introverted and it's a challenge. <laughs> it's a challenge and he's patient and understands, but there are times when I just, I tell him, can you please just say anything? Because I know you see me and you recognize me, but the quiet I always have to have music going the TV on something because the quiet it, it's it it affects me so deeply it's hard it's very very hard and it's, it's really not hard fair. yeah it's absolutely not and fair. and you know the thing of it is I mean I know you've gone through you know physical you know the domestic violence and stuff but what people don't get to it, and and this is an abuse is that nonverbal you know, whether it's the silent treatment or even like what my ex-husband would do, like he would watch TV. All he ever did was watch TV, but he kept this very nasty knife right next to him on the coffee table. And I always said it was like wearing a shock collar as a dog. Like it kept me in line because I knew that I knife was that. there. So he didn't have to say or do anything. And there were times there, there was one specific situation that I remember. Um, it was during the time he had, he had actually moved out on his own when he knew I was getting ready to file for divorce because he's a narcissist and he couldn't be left because that would be offensive to his ego. He had to leave me so that the world would think that I was insufferable and that he had to be the one to finally break up our marriage. But, um, I remember I, he, he was monitoring my me and our son with these ring doorbells and, and we had a four acre little farm so he had there were a couple of them and they would alert his phone which was annoying but I'm I, you know I just wanted to be done with this man I wasn't going to fight over everything but one afternoon I got home from work and my son was not home from school yet and I'm just standing there against the kitchen counter reading through the mail getting something to drink and I'd only been home maybe five or 10 minutes, but he must have seen on his ring doorbell that I had walked in the house. He tore up into the driveway. I turned and looked thinking, what's he doing here? What's going on? Because I thought he was pretty much all moved out. All his clothes were gone. He took whatever he felt he wanted to take from the house, including remote controls for the TV. So we couldn't, yeah, he played with us. He took light bulbs from my son's bathroom. You know, it's just playing games. So it's like, whatever, what is, what is he here for now? So he came in the house and I mean, obviously I still, 
I always said I felt like a rabbit. I just still like maybe if I stay perfectly paralyzed, he won't see me. If I hold my breath, he won't sense me. Didn't even look at me. Walked right by me up the stairs to the master bedroom, came right back down, holding his handgun, walked out, got in his truck and left. Why did he do that? To show me that he had a gun and that he was in control. And now, mind you, after this happened, obviously it shook me up. And and what is everybody's response? What happened? What, what did, did he, he do? Say? What did he do? Well, nothing really. He didn't say anything. Well, then why are you so upset? Well, let me tell you what what these things do. The silent treatment, this nonverbal intimidation, so to speak. By the end of our 25 years together and what was the final straw for me was that I was so physically ill. Every single day, I I actually started writing down my symptoms. I'm a type A, so I made a spreadsheet on Excel (laughs) of all my symptoms. And I was keeping track and even counting because when you go to the doctor, well, how often does this happen? I wanted to be able to say it happened seven times today. It happened 14 times this month, whatever it is. Give them accurate information because that's just who I am. So I had a spreadsheet, probably two dozen symptoms Everything from blurred vision, headaches, um, hands going numb, sometimes my whole arm, anything between constipation and diarrhea, heart palpitations, um, my heart rate, I could barely get up to a normal level. So then I'd get feverish. My muscles would stiffen. I mean, just such random things that I was trying to figure out what was going on. And I was having trouble breathing, which I couldn't understand because I had coached cross country at the grade school for nine years. I ran five miles every day. Like, how could I have breathing problems? I was healthy. I thought I was. So long and short of this, doctor after doctor, you're a hypochondriac. You're hypersensitive to your body. You probably just have anxiety or I don't know what's wrong with you. Finally get to a doctor who has a clue, gets me with Mayo Clinic, They took 19 vials of my blood. By this time, I had dropped to 93 pounds, skeletal, and for no reason. And the weight loss came within two weeks, which is not normal, especially for no reason. Right. I could barely tear toilet paper off the roll at this point. I knew something was very, very wrong. Mayo takes these 19 vials of blood, does a cortisol test, you know, urine tests, all these things. They came back and said that they think they compromised some samples because there's no way that my levels of this and that and the other thing are so high, but they were mainly concerned about the cortisol. And for those who don't know, cortisol is a stress hormone. It's very similar to adrenaline. I call it kind of like the sister hormone to adrenaline runs through your body when you're under stress. Well, guess what? I had so much cortisol, they Mayo ran another cortisol test on me, thinking the first one had been compromised because there's no way my levels are that high. My levels were that high. To give people an idea, your levels should be somewhere between like one and 600 at any time throughout the day. Mine were at about 2,500 and up um, consistently. And because it had been, cortisol had been running through my body for so many decades because of this constant stress I was under, my body thought it was fighting itself. So it actually started killing off my white blood cells, stopping my organ function. Um, So by the end of 2019, the doctor sat me down and said, okay, well, now you have a lung disease. It's just like having COPD and fibromyalgia, which explains all your symptoms, You have brachycardia. They talked about putting a stent in my heart just to keep the darn thing beating. I needed an oxygen unit to wear in a backpack so that I could breathe because my airway was also very narrow that they couldn't do whatever surgery could fix the lung problem. Um, But he said, you need to change your circumstances because your body is shutting down. And to be told in your early 40s that your body is shutting down when you are healthy and you think you have more than half your life yet to live, um, it's, it's startling to say the least. So that's when I finally just said, okay. I know what needs to change. And and that's when, you know, fortunately my, my relationship with my mother and stepfather kind of ended, um, 
as more their choice than mine. Um, but this had all happened right about this time that I got this diagnosis. And, and that's the same time that I just decided I had to be done with them. I had to be done with uh, my husband at the, at that time. And, you know, it's a really hard thing to go through. And I don't think people understand. I, I know that you will get this, but, you know, people that are alive and, and ha cannot be in your life because it's little, you know, your health and your mental and physical health are online. You are mourning them as if they died. Yes. As if the relationship, whether it's the relationship you had or the relationship you hoped of to course. have with them, you are mourning all of that, yet they are still walking around alive and they are not inviting you to Thanksgiving and they are not inviting you to Christmas and you are spending those holidays all by yourself because nobody else wants anything to do with you because they're associating with your abusers instead of supporting you because you are the problem, because you spoke up, because you are the reason that everybody is upset because you upset them with this atrocious lie that you are telling about these wonderful people. Right. So it was a very, very difficult time and talk about stress. I thought I was removing the toxicity from my life, but I was just adding on to it, but it was necessary. But I also stand here as an example that, you know, this was just at the end of 2019. I was divorced in 2020. Thank God I survived the violence that came after the divorce. And here I am three years later. I don't even know the last time that I used my oxygen machine. I have gained my weight back. I am healthy. I am happy. I am safe. I am in a very, very, very good, healthy relationship with a man I've known for a long time and who was there, you know, basically holding my hand through all of it. Thank God. Um, so it can change for the better. And I think people need to see examples like you and me that we know it's tough. You know, is it still hard for me? Yes. It is still hard that this is October and what's around the corner, Thanksgiving and Christmas, when I'm not going to be invited anywhere. My own son, I love him very much, but he goes to all his other families because unlike you, um, my mother and stepfather strangely just became grandparents of the year um, when they decided not to have relationship with me. They suddenly took great interest in my son and he is now very close to them. Um, he is also close to his father who tried to kill me, but I have to be understanding and love my son enough that if it took me 40 some years of hoping and praying for my mother's approval and hoping for her to love me, I have to understand that my son, who is only 20 years old, who watched his dad walk out on us how many times and leave us for other women a couple times and, you know, all the things that happen, he is looking for everybody's approval as well. So I have to let him run his course and just be the consistent and stable parent that he needs and he knows I'm always going to be here, but it's very, it's very hard not to feel a sense of disloyalty in that. Of course, you know, I wanted to, to seek out your expert thoughts on this because I talk to plenty of people who go through this and each one of them, you know, it breaks your heart to go through it. And of course it triggers you and you know, you've been through it too, but like a perfect example is I've written books. I've written multiple books and my brother hasn't, but I would get told back then they're like, oh, well, he wrote a thesis and that's much harder than writing. A book. And, you know, you don't see anything. and it's like, I know. Okay. No, I do actually know. I I'm going to intervene here. I swear we must, we must strangely have the same parents. <laughs> My know. brother, he, he was your typical golden child that did everything the narcissist parents wanted. So he has a doctorate in physics and God love him, but he's even told me he's not happy. He doesn't like his job. He doesn't, you know, but yes, he, he had a study that he participated in published in a journal and mother and stepfather bought I don't even know how many copies everybody in the universe knew about it. I've published a book and I'll be publishing two more. And I, you know, I'm being asked to speak in summits and I'm doing something positive and I feel really good about my achievements, you know, trying to help other people um, that have been where we are. 
I have not been acknowledged in any way. Yeah. In any way. They don't read it. They don't want anything to do with it. They have never in my entire almost 48 years of existence, and I mean this not once, ever said that they were proud of me. As a matter of fact, my stepfather said to my face that my my education, my college education, I have a bachelor's degree, was like having a kindergarten education compared to my brother and that I was apparently stupid. And I'm thinking in my head, I mean, I'm not a braggart, but I have a very, very high IQ. In fact, I did want to go back and get my master's and perhaps, but they, they said they weren't going to pay for it and I didn't have the money and I didn't have the ability to get the loans, but it's just amazing how they set you up. They have this idea about you and they don't let you succeed. You're not supposed to, you're supposed to fail. You're supposed to be stupid. You're supposed to be, you know, all these things that they think of you and they will not acknowledge any achievements typical narcissists right and they are so perfect when they're outside in the public but when that door shuts forget it it's a total Mm -hmm. different person my daughter asked her grandmother um how would you feel if mommy didn't make it out of surgery and she's like huh i've never heard them say i love you to me they've never you know uh my, my biological mother told me when i was nine that she was she miscarried me and that stayed with me my whole life because like you were saying that's verbal and that stays like I'm nine years old and I'm thinking, what do you, what is a miscarriage? What is it? What is that? Like, you're saying you wish you had miscarried me. What is that? And it didn't, it didn't matter. I, I went to court. I fought and won. I took uh, time and went to court to get the rights terminated on my ex and won. And it didn't matter what I did. It was never enough. And I never got that. I'm proud of you. You, you survived this. You've done something amazing. I mean, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, it's always going to come back and fall on what you you're not going to, you're going to fail. You have to fail so that they feel that they were right. Right. And I understand, but you know, for your mother to say that, you know, she wished she'd miscarried you. I was in that same boat. It's so openly talked about since I was a kid, even over this last weekend, I was visiting with family. Um, I have like three family members that I keep in touch with regularly that I call my family because that's all I have. But, you know, it came up still that, you know, my mother, when she found out she was pregnant with me, she was very, you know, she was a teenager. She was very small that when she found out it was too late for her to have an abortion. And I mean, that's just, why would you say that to, to a child, you know? And, and if she really didn't want me, then my God, why did she keep me? Why, why couldn't you give me to people? There are people out there They can't have their own children that would love that child with everything in them and give them a beautiful life. Right. You know, and, and and here's the irony that the, you know, like the universe's big joke on me. I was born on my mother's birthday. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, (laughs) that, that's the one that always gets me like, why, why? Cause I can't even have a birthday that I don't think about her and that she's not a part of in some way. Give you yourself know? a new birthday, like the day you broke free and yeah. no contact. You know, I, I remember I asked my grandmother, I, I was 15 ish, and I said, How could you? My grandparents were the best individuals in the yeah. world, like your great grandmother. And I said, How can I be so different than they are? You mm-hmm. raised them and you're like the best humans on the planet. And she goes, Well, I could ask you the same thing. And I didn't understand that at the time. And she was like, I didn't raise who that is. That is a hollow person. And I was like, I don't understand what you mean by hollow. And this really mm-hmm. got to me, Dana, because she said, you know, evil is a spirit and has a soul. Even evil has a spirit and a soul. She said, my son does not. He is hollow. There's nothing in him. And yeah. when I got older, I realized that, you know, okay, now I get that. Now I'm getting it. I see. And it, it's like, why, you know, we, we really go above and beyond to try to get that. I'm proud of you. You did such a great job. I, I tell my daughter every day, you are doing such an amazing job. You're beautiful. You've come so far. I mean, and if she does something she's not supposed to do, I'll be like, you know, I love you. I don't like what just happened. So let's talk about it. 
but I've yes. never yelled at her. I never screamed at her, but it's like, I love you, but I don't like the actions I just saw. So let's talk about it, you know, and that's how we talk about things and work it out. But it's, you go through life wondering, what have I done? What did I do so wrong to make you not love me? But you can love this one and you can love that one. And you can love some woman younger than me, but you can't appreciate or accept me. And I'm the only one who would ever be there for you. Exactly. And I mean, I, a hundred percent, everything you just said, I agree with, I, I have felt, I, and it's a tough one because I know that people have said, well, what if something happens to your mother? And I'm like, well, what if something happens to me? Because let me tell you when I was diagnosed and I needed that oxygen, that was right when the COVID pandemic was hitting. So try getting oxygen. I mean, my doctor was trying to even just get a sleep apnea machine just so I could have something to breathe, especially if God forbid, he said a common cold could kill you. You have no white blood cells. You have no immunity. A cold could kill you. If you get COVID, you, you will be one of those fatalities. He was trying to get me anything. And for people that don't know, like these, you know, some of these machines are thousands of dollars right. and like you, um, well, unfortunately I was still in my marriage to somebody that there was financial abuse with my ex-husband. Um, he completely drained us. He even drained his 401k without telling me blew all the money. We had nothing. We were paycheck to paycheck. I was even having to go to the food pantry for food oftentimes. So it was very hard. We were down to the penny when we were done paying the bills every month. And I was the only one working because he decided the last four and a half years of our marriage that he shouldn't have to work anymore. Um, in fact, he said, you better get to it, mama. It's your turn. And I had no choice. So I did. But there were my parents, my mother and stepfather. Regardless of having no contact and choosing to have no contact with me, you know, because I'm so insufferable, knowing my grandma, my godmother, I had family members going to them, even my brother, their son, going to them and saying she is having this problem. She needs oxygen. They live, <laughs> like a typical narcissist, they live in a six bedroom, four and a half bath. I mean, multi on acres. <laughs> they are worth at least over a million dollars. He drives a Jaguar. He has a Corvette. He has a Harley. She drives. I, I don't even know what she drives anymore. They have a lot of money. Yeah. Yep. And you know, they would not contribute one damn penny to help me breathe. And I came out of her womb. Yeah. And why we never will understand that Dana is because we're not like them. No. And you're right. And you know what? I don't want their money because I survived without them. You thrived. You are thriving. I am thriving. We're thriving. But it's still it the sucks. fact that these people can be up there and you want to talk about their hollow. They have no soul mm -hmm. because I could not know, even if it was my next door neighbor, I would do something, even if it's just five or $10, like yeah. let's get this money together. But I came out of this woman's womb and she would not help me breathe so that I could live. And when all that domestic violence was happening after my divorce, I had a knife situation. I had a gun situation. I had all kinds of things. He was telling people he was going to kill me. He emailed me that it would be easier if I was dead. I had to go to court for an order of protection because I was denied an emergency order of protection because I'd never called the cops on him before. Because I promised my son, my son didn't want to be one of those kids who everybody was talking about in the small podunk town that we lived in. So I was deemed not to be in danger. Right. So I got a court date to appeal it because I needed an emerge. I needed an order of protection against this man. I reached out to my mother, even though we were no contact. And I said, I really need your help. You have actually witnessed him putting his hands on me and, and situations. He showed up at their house drunk off his butt once to pick up our son and they'd let him take him by the way. Um, but I said, please, if you have any care for me at all, I need 
somebody to come testify to his character so that I can please get this order of protection. Told her everything that had happened. She said no. She said no. She wouldn't come to court. So, um, fortunately, I had a neighbor that I called and and she had actually heard my ex um, say that he wanted me dead and, you know, she'd have, she lived next door for 17 years. So she had heard and seen enough that she agreed to come to court to testify, even though her husband asked her not to, because they had four children and my ex-husband had shot their dog. And so they were a little concerned that there would be retaliation of some sort, um, because of his violent nature. And I understood, but that's what made me appreciate her more for coming. We got the order of protection. Mind you, it was that he couldn't come within 10 feet of me. 10 feet. I told the judge I'm 93 pounds. The wind could blow me over at this point. He could throw a two by four at me from 10 feet away from me. He could still shoot a gun. He could throw a knife. He could do all kinds of things. And that was all she was willing to give. So I took it. But um, yeah, our system's very flawed. People are, are, it, it sickens me that people are walking around this earth with no remorse and no conscience and that there are people that should be locked up and are not, they are freely walking around. And my ex-husband purposely moved seven miles away from where I live. And on these country back roads, that's about a five minute drive. <laughs> and, um, it's very unnerving. Um, that I, you know, I've had to pass by his house and I see that he has somebody moved in with him that she brought her two daughters and I, I, it's not my business and it's not my place, but I hope to God every day that she has a better relationship than what I had with him, that she is safe and that her daughters are not in any danger. Um, and like I said, even for my son, I just have to hope, I know he knows who his dad is, but I hope he's not too hurt when that day comes that he finds out how um, dispensable that he is as well. Um, but I will be there as I always have been to clean up the mess and pick up the pieces because that's well, just yeah. what I'm going to do. Yeah. It's horrible because like my mom actually said to me, oh, I would have never been that woman. I would have never let a man put his hands exactly. on me and beat me. I would never have loud. I wouldn't have loud. I said, do you think that we get up in the morning and say, hey, I don't have a bruise here. You want to put one here today? Because this is like the one spot that there's not bruises on me. Or do you think we raise our hand and say, hey, I want to get in a relationship with someone who beats us? None of, none of us do that. They put on this facade, they put on the mask, they act a certain way, they find that hole that grabs a hold of us, and then they rush us through the express line of, let's get into this relationship and get super serious, and then it all starts. And that's exactly what happened. And for someone to say, especially a mom, to say, hey, I would never let that happen to me. You can't say that, you don't know, it's one in four. And if it's one in four, that's reported, what is it reported? So right. these are the numbers that aren't reported. And for you, yeah, to say, I was one that wasn't reported. Right. I so did not re say, ever report it. Hey, I would never let it happen to me. You know, I mean, really, that's ridiculous. And, you know, I had the opposite experience with my mother when we were still talking because I couldn't talk to too many people. You know, there were all these rules to follow. Of course. Um, yes. And my mother was the opposite. She actually would tell me oh, well, you know, just go along with it. Or just, she actually once, I forget how she put it. She actually wrote it in a card to me that it's okay to be a hypocrite, but I should just, as long as she said, as long as you look good and keep a clean house and, and, and just, you know, ha have the things that you want to have, it's okay to be a hypocrite and just go along with it and submit to it. And I'm like, okay, so, I mean, obviously that was the choice she made, you know, because when things did end for the final time with us, that was the conversation that I had with her. As a matter of fact, I was on my hands and knees begging, crying and begging her to please have any relationship with me, no matter how strained it might be. And she said she couldn't be my mother and her husband's wife at the same time and that she wasn't willing to give up her life with her fancy house and her fancy cars and all the money and the things. And I thought, wow, 
Wow. Cause you hit the nail on the head earlier that, that one hit me hard when you said money cannot buy happiness. Doesn't it, it really doesn't. Yeah. I knew I, I will live on the streets Yep. with my husband that I'm married to right now before I would ever even think about living in that mansion with my mother and her husband and, and having all that stuff. Cause I did that. I was that kid. I was that teenager that boy, when Cavarici pants came out and they were 80 bucks, 90 bucks mm-hmm. a pair, I had every color. I had every style. Did that make me happy? No, no, no. It didn't change me at all because my mother didn't hug me and love me. And she never came to any of my orchestra concerts or my softball games. Right. Never. Yeah. Oh yeah. They held my, my inheritance over my head. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> Life's too short. Yeah. I, I don't even want it. <laughs> you know, I, I can't and I won't. And I don't I'm pretty sure mine's been removed, but if it hasn't, I mean, I, you know, and that's the thing that gets me. And I think that's where I was going earlier. I went off on a tangent, but you know, I know that like my grandma especially will say, well, what happens if, if something happens to your mother or not? I, if I'm not a bad person and I don't even have to qualify myself that way. I know I'm not a bad person, but I don't have any feeling. I'm not going to cry about it. I'm not going to be upset. I honestly don't think I would even go to the service because why right. to put on a show just like they made me do all those years living in that home growing up. Right. I'm not going to pretend. I, I'm sure my brother will be very sad and I'm sorry for him, but it will not make me sad. It doesn't make me any happier for them to be alive or dead or anything. I just am indifferent to it because right. they don't mean anything to me. All they have done is hurt me. And it's hard to feel any loss when all somebody has done is hurt you. Right. And you just can't understand it because like my mother walked away from her entire family um, when she married my dad, just for no reason, walked away, had nothing to do with them. I never got a choice to meet them and make my own decision. I met them in my twenties and I decided that I wanted to make my own opinion and see what I thought of them. And I, you know, they weren't, they were, how how do you say they were more than living paycheck to paycheck. Like they barely scraped by, they had no money. They were living in like a seven, 800 square foot home. Um, but they were humble and they seemed to really care. Um, and they told me the only thing they asked is that she not rush into this with him he picked her up for a date and he was in a brand new sports car she saw the money that was it like that was it she was like I'm marrying him and they have a 10,000 square foot home they have seven car garage they have this they have that but I've never seen them be affectionate to each other I've never seen them kiss I've never seen them hold hands um you go to dinner dance it was uncomfortable I don't miss it at all excuse me you go to dinner and there's not one word spoken unless it's ordering the food other than that, there's no conversation during the meal. None. Wow. They eat out every meal. You know, she has the maids and the yards and the landscapers and all that. And it's like, how can you even be happy? Like, you can't. How can you be happy here? Right. Because you're but that's the thing. I don't think it's about <laughs> happiness. I think that, you know, it's unfortunate that mothers like ours, it's not about being happy. They just, they want a certain life. And that is... They put that before everything else. It's their priority and and good for them that they got what they wanted, but it's not what I would want. It's not what would make me happy. Honestly, the happiest time in my life was when I was a little girl living in a crap apartment in Chicago with my great grandma with cockroaches. And, you know, at one point I didn't, you know, have a bed even. I remember I, you know, but then we did and but we didn't have anything. We had, we We had had a lot of rice. We ate a lot of rice and a lot of cream of wheat. And if I got a McDonald's hamburger, that was an extra special treat, but I had love. And that That was the one time in my life that I had love. And that, that to me is the most important thing. That's right. That's the most valuable thing. Money can't buy anything when it comes to love like that. No, and money's nice. I mean, I'd be happy in Punta Cana right now. I mean, (laughs) you know, but but it's not gonna, it's not gonna change anything. Like even the, even I see it go into my life too, because I'm not one of those people that 
has to have like a certain car or any, like, I don't care. It gets me from one place to another. I don't even care if I have a vehicle. It doesn't mean anything, but so many people are concerned with status and things yes. and even clothes, do you know, to this day, we make a very good living. My husband and I, I still, will, I cannot buy anything retail. I shop at Goodwill for my clothes. You know, I, I'm not that. ashamed of it. I'm not, I can actually buy a lot of clothes for 40 or 50 bucks, which if I went to a regular store, I'd be lucky get shirt. <laughs> to get a shirt or a pair of jeans. If yeah, jeans even are worse, but you know, I'm perfectly fine. And I don't even need that much clothes. I'm like, where do I go? I wear leggings and tops or maybe a pair of jeans and a, a top. I, what do I need? That right. stuff isn't going to make me happy. Right. Maybe for about five minutes as I'm admiring how good it looks on me in the mirror, but <laughs> you know, beyond that, nobody cares. It's so true. And that's what I love about my husband is we are aligned in that way. He's made a very you know, good life for himself. And we have everything we need plus some, but he's kind of, I laugh because he's just like me. He wears like the same two or three t-shirts. Like he just alternates them and wears the same jeans over and over. It's just like, yeah, we're just not into stuff. We don't buy stuff for the house. We don't. Yeah. There's we nothing want to live our life and people criticize and say, oh, you guys just came back for a from a trip. You're going on another trip or you're, Yes. Yes, we are because we're trying to live our lives. Like we don't need cars and payments and things. We like to spend our money going and having experiences and seeing things and, and traveling and whatever. But yeah, it, it's, it's a tough situation. I, I feel for anybody that's ever been bullied, abused in any way. Um, This narcissistic stuff, I feel like is sometimes worse because it's so all encompassing. It's not just verbal abuse or physical abuse or, you know, manipulation. It's everything plus the financial abuse, sexual abuse. I know there were some situations in my marriage. I didn't want him touching me, but you know, who was going to believe me that. Right. And I some people think that's not a crime. Yeah. If you're married, it's okay to engage in non-consensual behaviors well it's not because it still violates you still in the rape. same way right yeah and Absolutely. and it's it's exhausting it's it's exhausting to live it it's exhausting even to try to explain it to people who haven't been through it but you know certainly i think we're all in agreement that you know we need to be an example for those who are still in it that there it's still better on the other side of it if you can get out safely and this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, so we definitely want people to know that there are also resources out there. And yes, it's scary. The unknown is scary. You were made to believe you can't make it. You were maybe restricted from finances or told to stay home with the kids and not have a job so you have no financial freedom and no way out. There's always a way out. There's always a way out. Yes. Tell everybody the name of your book. I just ordered it yesterday. I'm very excited about reading it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's called Gasping for Air, The Stranglehold of Narcissistic Abuse. Um, obviously, it references my lung issue that I developed uh, in the abusive situation, but also the fact that it does feel, you know, like you're being held down into it. Um, you're just so scared to leave and you're scared of the consequences of trying to escape it. But um, you know, it just goes, my, my book just tells of the 25 year relationship, starting with the, the day he walked into my life and all the way to the day he walked out, um, for the final time. So, um, it's definitely a roller coaster ride. I don't know what to say when people tell me what a great book it is because it is based on <laughs> my, my actual life and it wasn't as fun, but, um, and it's even sadder to me that so many people can relate, Yeah. but it has also served to help people that work with victims or survivors, however you term yourself, of domestic violence. Um, you know, legal professionals have told me it, it gives them a perspective. Mental health professionals are helped better because when you're in those relationships, you're in such a fog and you're confused and you can't even make sense of it. I used to always say I couldn't make sense of the nonsense, you know, so 
hopefully my book helps to do that. I've been told it does to, to kind of explain the raw emotions and, and the feelings and the thoughts. I mean, every thought I ever had in that 25 years is in this book and some of them aren't nice. You know, when he would leave to go somewhere on his motorcycle. Yeah. I, I, I had terrible thoughts of, I hope he gets hit by a semi and doesn't come home. And that's terrible and awful. But I have all also always said that I think abuse turns you into somebody you don't want to be. Right. Absolutely. But if you don't turn into that person, you might never get out either. That's true. How can everybody find you, Dana? Sure. On my website is probably the best way, www.danasdiaz.com. The link to buy the book is there, although it's sold anywhere. Books are sold online. Um, link to Facebook and Instagram are on there. If anyone wants to follow me, I post content every day to help you heal resources, anything I think will be helpful for anybody in an abusive situation. Um, I also have a blog and podcasts, including this one, will be on the press room page. Well, I would love if you would come back again with us. I would love to be back. That'd be phenomenal. Oh, yes. Well, I'm going to make sure everything is in the listener notes so that everybody can see it and find it. I cannot wait to read this book and <laughs> I'm going to get you back on here sooner rather than later, but I can't thank you enough for being here. Whenever. It's been my pleasure. And unfortunately speaking about this, but it has been my pleasure. And I think that we definitely have reached a few people. I think so. Thank you so much. Thank you.